Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Something a little different today. My guest is Dr. Joseph Sweeney. He's not a psychologist. He is a writer, an avid gamer, an educator, an industry advisor, and he researches in the area of how humans work with technology um, as tools and how this shapes not only the tools, but how it shapes us as well. He's currently writing a book with the working title of The Future of Work, and that's a little of what he's here to talk to us about today. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much. I'm excited to have you here. I, I'm fascinated by the future of work and, and even the history of work really as, as a concept, mm-hmm. because as a workplace psychologist, you know, I know that our experience of work shapes so much of our lives and that has changed considerably since, say, the Industrial Revolution, but we're probably at a point where it's changing even more rapidly with the introduction of a lot of these digital technologies that are allowing you and I to speak together today, (laughs) aside from anything (laughs) else. And work from home. (laughs) And yeah, and work from home. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful uh, capabilities that we didn't have even, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps. But what is it that fascinates you about how humans use technology? Look, we're not the only animal that uses tools. Uh, Crows use tools, monkeys use tools and so forth. So this is not something that's truly unique to humans. But what is unique is our tools almost define us. Um, So if you think about uh, just, you know, we're talking now, we're communicating, but we're communicating through our tools. That is changing the fabric of our society. So these deep, you know, it's deeply connected to us. It's in our DNA. And that fascinates me. And what really interest has been interesting uh, to me as a technologist, because I started my life as a technologist, mm-hmm. is really the fact that it changes our cognition. It actually impacts how we think, because the way that we use tools, the way that we use technology shapes our language. And of course, as you know, as a psychologist, that sh- shapes the way we think. Mm. Then when you get more nuanced than that, you start looking at different cultures, And you mentioned when you started, you mentioned uh, that the workplace or work is our identity. But if you look at what's happening in, say, India and how identity is tied to work in India, it's quite different from how it's tied to work in Australia. So there's these incredible nuances in this space. It's like a giant global Rubik's Cube where we don't actually know what the answer is. We don't know what the colour patterns are going to eventually be. Cool. What a, what a great analogy. And so when we talk about this idea that technology shapes our cognition and our identity, can you give me an example of, of what that might look like for you know the everyday person? Absolutely. I think we're in what some psychologists have called the great human experiment right now. I've done a lot of work in education. It's, um, so while I started my life as a technologist, it's actually human cognition that fascinates me and and how we learn things and how we interact with things. When I was doing my educational research, um, what I discovered very clearly is that modelling behaviour is what gives rise to literacy. It gives rise to the words in our brain, if you Mm -hmm. will, Mm -hmm. which then gives rise to the thinking and so forth. Now, the ramification of that is that children who are read to from about the age of zero to six by their parents want to be their parents. This is how we learn. We want to model. We want to play. It's a modeling thing. It's my interest in gaming. But here's the killer. If they are not read to, they'll still develop language skills. They'll still develop those skills, but they will be consistently lower performing throughout their educational and, most frightening, all through life. So books are a technology. Mm -hmm. Now, the logical question when I started reading this and I was looking at the medical research and I was looking at the longitudinal 45 years worth of data we've got on this stuff, and it's it's so clear that reading to your child results in better long-term life outcomes right across the board. We then said, okay, kids have been given iPads. Kids have been given reading programs. Does this make a difference? 
And when I started looking at that, there was very little data to support mm. one way or the other. The more I look at the data coming out now, the more I say it makes zero difference. Okay. In other words, giving a kid an iPad and having them read on the iPad or even do a really well-constructed educational program does not improve their literacy. It does not have anywhere near the same impact as a parent reading. Why? Uh-huh. Yeah, why? Well, the reason for it, <laughs> why is that? Well, the reason for it is actually quite obvious. What does a child, what does an infant want to be more than anything else? Their parents. They want to be their parents. So yeah. if the parent is demonstrating language and patterns and all of the stuff which goes on in nursery rhymes and song and book reading, they value that because the parent values that. So, and is so it the, the relationship, learning. The relationship yes. and that connection. Okay, yeah, yeah, which is exactly. very much my domain. <laughs> Exactly. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, giving a kid an iPad is is not beneficial. I'm just saying it's not anywhere near as beneficial as reading. Now, mm-hmm. what we haven't seen any data on is if you sit with an iPad and a child and you read from the iPad, mm-hmm. how does that change cognition? Okay. We do know from one study in a, in a school, which I've never been able to find again. I, I read it and tucked it away and never found <laughs> it again. It's a real pity. <laughs> but we do know that if you have uh, if you deliver iPads into, say, a kindergarten to year three class and it's a one-to-one program, you won't get much benefit. But if you do it on a one-to-two program, one device to two children, that sharing of knowledge, that sharing of the learning does increase. Interesting. So this is at the low end. Now, when we get into the workplace, you're asking, now, how does this work in the workplace? We do know that just simply having email running in the background in your computer, even if you're not accessing it, will drop about 12 IQ points off you in terms of performance. Now, it makes it sound like I'm really negative on technology. <laughs> I'm not. You know, technology clearly augments us. I'm highly dyslexic, and I would have never been anywhere nearly as successful in my life if it wasn't for me being introduced to computers and realizing I could use them to augment my dyslexia. But we also have to understand that there are cognitive negatives to this as well as positives. And that's the fascinating thing, I suppose, about science and about research is that it's always, Mm -hmm. it's the questions, isn't it? You know, it's, we don't want to take any of this at face value. We want to know why, why is this? Is it in fact the technology that plays a part, whether that's a book or an iPad when it comes to kids reading, or is it in fact the act of doing it with somebody else that is facilitating that learning and growth? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to make assumptions based on, what seems apparent or what seems on the surface, we've got to actually ask the question why and how. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's really important that you ask the right, the, the right question why in the right way. One of the things that um, I discovered through my, my research, so my academic research is quite different from my technological research. Uh, one, I earn a lot of money with the other one. I earn no money with that. <laughs> That's the first thing, workplace in the future. If you want to be an academic, yeah, don't expect to be rich. But it, it was fascinating. And one of the things I looked at was, what led, how do these social intentions, how does this, this concept, that technology, putting tech into classrooms is going to prepare kids better for the future? And, you know, just asking if that's real is, is quite problematic. Mm. Um, so what I did is I looked at all the research that led into why governments and, and why um, education departments were spending all this money on tech. Why? And you start to deconstruct it, and it's all about the workforce. It's all under this notion that we're walking, you know, we've got this new information society. Yep. You dig a little bit deeper and say, okay, what justified that? And you discover that the way that we were measuring, the way that we were determining whether, you know, $4.2 billion investments uh, in, in, in the last decade in the space, was it actually seeing outcomes? And they're always saying, yes, they're positive. But when you actually look carefully at how the research was done, you discover that, they're really just going back to the teachers and the kids and saying, hey, we gave you all this new technology. We gave you all these new computers. Did you like it? And the kids go, like yes. It. And the teachers go, yes. And literally, I mean, I'm, I'm being oversimplistic. And then when you, and it's only recently, it's only about the past five years that some people have said, hang on, hang on. Did that actually change school results? And the answer to that in Australian context, at the very least, is absolutely no. I see very little evidence that big investments in tech in schools has changed education when, and it's only when, you discount the changing in teaching practices that happened. Okay, yeah. So we've got to kind of clarify the variables involved there. You've got to to pull out those variables. And what's really scary is then you pull back, okay, why were we researching in that fashion? And you go back about 35 years to a program that was called Rockman et al., 
So that was that was the 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 the, the participants in the report. Rockman et al. People in in here know. Um, Reports et al usually means and others. So, yes. you know, such and such a super professor and others. No, Rockman et al <laughs> was the name of a research company. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Specifically <laughs> named so that they could make it look like an they academic could make playground. It look like a study. Exactly. And it was sponsored Very by Microsoft, who, who gave a huge number of computers uh, and uh, Fujitsu, huge number of computers into Maine as an education. They set a program which would always see, you know, it was guaranteed to see positive results. Yeah. That, that, that process has been replicated over the years so no wonder we find ourselves in a situation where literally we we have this blind spot about what really matters in how we use technology in education and in fact what the technology will look like in the future and how our children will interact with it and how that will then move forward into, into their adult life now, all of that's a quick way of saying, sorry, a long way of saying, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm, I'm exceedingly concerned with what I see. I'm a technologist, and I think that we're overplaying the technology hand in a lot of these spaces. So we're jumping on a bandwagon that you feel, or the evidence suggests, just doesn't have support in terms of, is it educational outcomes? Um, yes, educational you know, outcomes. That gets into a whole other, yeah. other issue yeah. around how educational oh, outcomes yeah. oh, are yeah. assessed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And, and are they wor- are they worthy? Now you know yeah. is, the, the ramifications of this can are actually quite important. So, for example, at the moment we hear a lot about STEM and STEAM. Uh, that's science, technology, education, maths. I'm a huge advocate of those subjects, but I'm a huge advocate on them, not because I think that every kid is going to be a, a, a software coder in the future. In fact, teaching kids to code when it's done as we see with quite a few educational policies, when it's done because they will be coding in the future and if you don't mm. code in the mm. future, you won't have a job, is rubbish. Mm. We are already seeing the majority um, of high-tech companies very much looking at AI and what we call rapid application design to write code. Yep. So that job in the future is going to be automated It'll be redundant well. more, far, you know, more quickly than we I wouldn't say fully redundant, but it's going to be pretty. <laughs> it pretty won't be fun. the need. Yeah. I mean, how many television repairmen do we have these days? Yeah. This is, this is the thing. That, that's so interesting so, because I have, yeah. I have two sons in primary school and one is, I would say at this point, you know, but being the psychologist, I'm always, you know, observing interests and strengths and, and where their passions, where they get engaged in things. Oh, and one, one yeah, right yeah, <laughs> yeah, one is creative. He loves to build his Lego. He loves to play Minecraft. He loves to design things in Minecraft. So it's not, whereas his brother plays Fortnite. I don't know that's another topical issue. <laughs> and he, you know, loves the social interaction. So I watch these two kids who are very different. One is very sporty, very social. The other is very creative. I would say traditionally more um, in inverted commas, geeky, um, in a very positive way, because I consider myself to be the same. For that. <laughs> Thumbs up for the geeks. Um, <clears throat> And I look at, because there is this kind of discourse around, you know, what will jobs be? Well, every kid needs to have an iPad in class and every kid needs to learn, you know, how to code. And I think, well, that's fine. And and for one of my sons, that may be a real passion for him. You know, he may really, I mean, I might be completely wrong, but that may be where he's engaged. But the other one has people skills. That's his strength. And as a workplace psychologist, I kind of look and I spend my time uh, every day in workplaces. People skills are really, really important. And I just can't see that going away. <laughs> I don't think we're going to replace that. Yeah. Yes. And, and this takes us to this whole area of, you know, the theory of multiple intelligences and, mm-hmm. and, and so forth. I'm very careful about oversubscribing to those those models. But there is definitely truth that humans have preferences in their psychology. Now, I'm not a psychologist. Don't understand it, but it's, it's really obvious. Simply assuming that they will make you good for one job or another is very misleading. And it's also misleading for a teacher to assume these things because obviously, you know, humans will flip between different ways. Sometimes we will be more social. Uh, yep. I'm being very social now. <laughs> Normally, yep. I don't like to be disturbed. <laughs> we are very malleable. Yes. Yeah, we're very malleable. Great. But I look at this from the issue of, our, do we have the right policies in place to prepare our, our our kids for the things that we do know about the future? If you can dig it up, I advise you to put a little link after this to mm-hmm. a wonderful video called Eve 2000. Uh, it's on YouTube somewhere. 
it is not uh, the game Eve. It's a pre-movie program. So remember when they had the old movies from the 1930s, and it was what fashion would look like in the year 2000. Yeah. Cool. And um, I actually use this video to talk about futurism because what I say before I play the video, and I'll tell your listeners to do the same, is watch the video and while you're watching it, say, what did they get right? And then ask themselves, what did they get wrong? And every time I show that, people, there's sort of this, this laughing as you watch it because it's crazy. It's insane. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the language is just glorious. It's so much of its 1930s era. But then when you stop and think about it, the technology was frighteningly accurate, right down to mobile phones, even the size of the mobile phones. Okay, they're wearing them around their neck and they use them like a phone, but, Mm. you know, so much of it was right. And yet when you then say, what did we get wrong? Usually it's only people of colour or women who raise their hand and discuss what was wrong because the social aspects are completely and utterly bizarre by our current standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So futurologists are, can actually get tech really right. We're pretty, we're pretty certain when we know we're tracking very well to when AI will become what we call generalised AI. Um, we're tracking pretty well towards um, life extension, drugs, that sort of treatment. Mm. We're tracking well to all of these technologies, but we have no idea what that's going to do to our culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in that light, my, my quest is what policies do you put in place now to prepare ourselves for the culture we want. And that is probably the underpinning of why I want to write this book, because I do not believe that education policy, as we currently view it, is coming in from the right angle. It's increasingly viewing, and this is not just junior education, this is all the way up to universities and how we're thinking about universities now. We're currently looking at them increasingly as generating human capital, making people for jobs. Mm-hmm. which is crazy mm-hmm. because, yes. one, we know that some of those jobs just aren't going to exist, so yeah. you don't know what those yeah. jobs are. Two, how people hire for jobs will change. Currently, we're hiring on skills, but you go and to- look to a company like uh, Parameters where they use artificial intelligence to read a person's multiple personality traits, compare those to an analytic an analysis of the company's overall, if you will, meta personality, mm-hmm. and then match where you fit in that company. Who cares about your, uh, your your job credentials and that thing? Yeah. It's, you're talking about your son. <laughs> do they fit that profile and where do yeah. they fit in the company? Yeah. So, you know, we, we need to be looking at, at humans as human, not as pieces of a machine that runs industry. Mm. Now, that mm. sounds very liberal. It sounds very theoretical. It's actually really, really hard and tangible. I'm an engineer by trade. I mean, that's, I, I think, in, in bits and bytes. But... The answer is not sitting in those bits and bytes. It's sitting in these soft issues. Yeah, and that, again, is a really interesting topic. You know, I, I, you know, as a psychologist and have a fundamental belief in the importance of being human (laughs) and (laughs) the role in which there there were two things there, I think you said. One was about this kind of shaping or taking the action now in policy or or in other, Mm. you know, activities that helps to shape the culture that we want to see in the future. And I think that is, it's a complex issue. I can quite understand that, you know, where things would go wrong because a lot of people don't necessarily have a good understanding of what, how our behaviour now might shape what happens or our decisions now might shape what happens into the future. Um, but the other part about that kind of matching jobs for, matching people for jobs, because I know that that's been a personal frustration of mine. I, I perhaps grew up with an old fashioned idea of education. You know, I was told that we went to university to learn to think and that it, we were there to expose ourselves to ideas, to learn to think critically about ideas. Um, mm. It was really a, as much an exercise in personal growth as a human being as it was skills training to take on a job. And it, it took me a very long time from my beginning undergraduate year and a commerce degree at Melbourne Uni through to when I actually got to registration as a psychologist, A, because that just takes a long time and B, because I'm uncertain about what I was doing and kind of spread it out over a further period. And I do see even in my own profession now, there's a whole lot more pressure from universities, I think, um, and perhaps cultural pressures. And I know Medicare plays a part in this for students to start a psychology degree as a specific degree. And you you work through your whole six years to get registered so that you come out as a clinical psychologist with a Medicare Mm. provider number and off you go, there's your job. 
and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of room for do I enjoy this? Is this actually a good match for me as a person? Yeah. And, and you know what? That that model is the model of the last two decades. Mm. And um, universities have definitely moved towards being more of an engine for creating certification for industry. Mm. But this is going to get really interesting. One of the things that I am seeing, and, and I, I work with a number of universities and, and, and higher ed, the challenges that they're facing are that businesses are coming to them less so in Australia, but certainly this is happening overseas and saying, we don't, we don't need a six year degree. We want this, this and this. We want these five things. Make us a course for each of those five things and we will pay our students to go to your university and just do those classes mm-hmm. and you will certify them. So we'll end up and, you know, there's a very real danger in this, by the way, the over commercialization or the, the focus on skills without having people understand the broader context because it's flexibility in the future. If we're going to have, as we do predict from uh, just, you know, how we're tracking with technology, if we do see that AI um, is going to become generalised, currently it's very applied, but if we see more AI, if we see deep job losses in the service sector, which we are already seeing, then you better be prepared to be able to jump between different roles. You better be prepared to do something that machines don't do very well. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, mm-hmm. that's ask the right questions. That's the first one. <laughs> yeah. um, it's this concept of, you know, let's call it creativity, um, although we do know that machines are going to become creative um, by based on how we currently perceive creativity. But there are certain types of – it will be the human using and guiding the machine – using the tool, if you will, in new and creative ways. And yet these machines themselves are becoming increasingly smarter and increasingly more creative. You can't teach that with a certification course. Yeah. Yeah. That gets back to to the origins of universities, which were to create um, effectively, you know, let's be really honest about it, was actually to, uh, to protect the nobility. It was to reinforce nobility and why they're different <laughs> from everyone else. But the teleos, the, the idea behind that type of education was to create a well-rounded human being. Interestingly, uh, the Catholic education space um, largely still has that ideal. It's, it's really right up front in a lot of their education. And the reason for that is it comes from their uh, pastoral imperative. They want to create a moral framework. Now, you could say that, well, let's call it actually not a moral framework. It's really, in, in, in philosophical speak, it's an ethical framework. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, university used to have an ethical framework. Yeah. And other schools, they do have their own ethical frameworks. The question is, as parents, how can we make sure that the ethical framework we're creating around our children that we are passing on to them will make them successful in the future. I'm not just talking about right or wrong. Mm. I'm talking about being happy, being comfortable, and ultimately being successful. Mm. And, you know, obviously what constitutes success and so forth is, a, is, a, is another discussion. But certainly we are seeing, I think, a very damaging um, problem in education, which is we need to prepare kids for this job, and that's yeah. getting increasingly yeah. specific when in fact that's the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. We need to be mm. making these kids flexible. We yeah. need to be giving them um, incredible, in, incredible uh, agility and tying that back to their own personal strengths and their own personal weaknesses. I'm mm. dyslexic. I need to augment that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm very interested in how, in how special education is, is now looking at working with students who are either super bright or suffering, you know, um, any number of mental health issues, we should be taking some lessons from there because some of the stuff they're doing is mm. really transferable into the broader community. Mm. I know um, Scott Barry Kaufman is a, a psychologist, mm. incredibly smart man um, in the States who does a lot of work in that area because as I understand it from uh, hearing about and reading his own personal story of struggling with a specific learning disabilities, I think it was, but also, you know, and when you listen to him, it's very clear giftedness. So both yep. sides of the, of the <laughs> so he's done a lot of research into that yeah. topic. Wonderful. Oh, I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to, that's another one yeah, for me I'll to dig into. Thank you. you. <laughs> another, another one to put in the links, please. Oh, I know, I know. Another book I, I'd strongly recommend in that space is um, quite a controversial book out of its time. It was called Elitism. 
And it was literally a call to take children who are very high performers, you know, the, the top half a percent, and really not worry so much about their classic education, but literally just engage them in true philosophy, you know, deep mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thinking. Because uh, what this gentleman discovered, and I, I forget the author's name, but um, a lot of these highly gifted people in America were going into jobs they really didn't enjoy. So they were going into finance because that's where the money was and all of their education was said success is money. Yeah. And yeah. yet they're miserable. These yeah. should be the leaders. These should be the scientists. These should be changing society. And yet we're, wasting, them on, we're mm. wasting them on the banking sector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you said something interesting before about this notion of the, the ethical structure around our educational bodies because I, I have a lot of colleagues who work in the positive education space. So starting to take positive psychology as a field of study and apply it in our education setting, which really is starting to look at, it's an extension of, of bits of work that have been done in social and emotional learning in schools, but it's mm. starting to, you know, look at things like values and character strengths and how do we actually cultivate an environment, a, a language, a set of guidelines from the youngest ages around mm. these concepts such that we can actually actually create, you know, happier and in adverted commas, successful people. And I don't mean successful in that kind of, they make lots of money or they have high prestige, but successful in that they find joy in what they do and they find contentment and they find engagement and they choose careers that really suit who they are. Yeah. And can move between those careers whenever they feel Mm. like they need a change. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think that last statement shouldn't be underestimated. Finland and Norway have been doing a lot of work in that space. And there's some of the highest performing educational departments um, in the OECD schools. Um, and the, the reason for that is really simple. Uh, and, and we've known this for over 45 years. This is the ridiculous thing. So much research, and, and I am all, if you can't show me statistically significant shifts, um, then I, I then it's just a theory and it doesn't hold up. Mm-hmm. But we do know from lots of data that students that are what we would call engaged, that actually enjoy what they're doing and see it as having real world relevance. Because remember, kids want to be adults. They want to be us. Mm. And if they're doing things that they feel like are worth of us, <laughs> then they'll be engaged. Um, so authentic learning, um, being happy, being enthusiastic, hugely important. Interestingly, so is failing. So it's not a matter of, hey, everyone should be happy that they're going to be successful. It's wow, you tried something, it, you totally botched it. We're going to tell you you totally botched it. We're going to tell you why you botched it, and then you're going to do it again. Um, so it is, a, it is very much this issue of how do you – and you take a look at the best teachers in the, in, in the space. Their lessons are always very much couched in you must do your very best. That's all I expect from you. And – when you're not doing your best, I'm going to call you out on it. And they're pretty, <laughs> the best performing teacher is pretty brutal in that sense. But the other part of it is that you don't teach to test because that's just ridiculous. That's just soul destroying. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no evidence that I have seen anywhere that teach to test, in other words, teaching to NAPLAN or any mm-hmm. of these standardized STEM sort of curriculas, actually result in better long term outcomes. I'm talking outcomes outside of education, career paths. You said that it doesn't matter if you're not earning a lot, but there's strong correlation between this type of education and income. There's also a very strong correlation between this type of education, uh, high literacy education is what I'd call it, and uh, not being involved in drugs, not being involved in, in, in crime, having much more resilience towards mental illness or just having much lower prevalence of mental illness. Just it's right across, And physical illness, it's right across the board. There's so many indicators of this type of education being correct. But... It doesn't play well in policy because it's much easier to get a call for educational change when you are saying we need to prepare kids for the future. Mm -hmm. In fact, the digital education revolution here in Australia, which was originally, if you go back to the original concepts of it from Gillard and and, and Rudd, forget, you know, politics, but the original content of this was to close the education gap, which was, and still is significant in Australia. I, I struggle with this. I work with this every day, trying to help some education departments figure out how to close this. And yet, when the final policy document was created, it was all about let's give every kid a computer. Mm. It had nothing to do with closing that education gap. 
So we started we with the right intent. But and we end up with this bizarre, <laughs> no, we've got to prepare children for having computers when they go to work. I'm oh. sorry, 80% of kids, when they, ra- when they ran that program, 80% of kids had computers in the home anyway. anyway if it yeah. did anything, it actually prepared, it, it, it forced teachers to get more digitally literate. Mm. Uh, very expensive way of doing that. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I think my big struggle is how do you, how do you get this deep cultural change when, when the government is so focused on a very narrow view of what society is, because that's the only way they can get their policies across both, you know, whichever side of the politics, and get them across the line. Mm. And increasingly, when uh, we're seeing commercial interests come into education, especially around technology, the technology is being driven into education as much as being pulled into it. You know, vendors have big interests in getting it into schools. Take a look at what Microsoft's or Google is doing. They're giving their stuff into schools. Yeah. Here, have it for free. All students, you get this. All students, you get that. Mm. Why? Because they're going to one day be using that technology when they're no longer in school, and that's yeah. when they get that money. And yeah. they've been doing that for 40 years. I'm not saying it's wrong, but we need to be a little bit clearer about what we want out of society. We know where the tech is going. We just need to be very clear about what what society should look like in the future. So, Joe, can I bring this back to some practical stuff, I suppose, for Mm. parents in particular? You know, we have, and and it was interesting because I did hear a story very recently of of, of a friend who'd had her son in a school, um, I think he was probably about the same age as my son, so perhaps year four, and Mm -hmm. uh, she was very concerned because there seemed to be a very heavy reliance on the technology. Kids were sort of, well, this is her version of events anyway, kids were kind of parked in front of laptops and and iPads and told to just kind of do their thing and there wasn't a whole lot of engagement with the Mm. teacher. There was a lot of pressure for parents to provide quite expensive technology to kids Mm -hmm. that then had to be, and of course she had practical, you know, anyone with a with a primary school age child is like, they're not very good at looking after their things. (laughs) And I'm just spent two grand on a laptop. I I I actually did I actually did a study on that very issue, but we'll we'll continue. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And what did you find? Uh, it was really, it was actually part of that academic, that big academic study into the digital education revolution. Um, when students were given devices uh, from the school, we had an average break rate of 12 to 15%, which means mm-hmm. at any one time, 12 to 15% of those you know, multiple hundred thousand dollars, you know, fleets just huge, were being repaired. Yep. When children were given the computer directly, it dropped down to about 7%. When the parents and the child were jointly made responsible, it dropped down to about five. Aha, uh-huh. there you go. Okay, interesting. So, yes, well, that does sort of make some logical sense. So co-ownership with the parent was what mattered there. Yeah. <laughs> and you look at that and you just go, well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> but, There's yeah. all these parents chasing around going, where's your laptop? What have you done with your laptop? Be careful with your laptop. <laughs> yeah, but we also saw, you know, in, in addition to that, and, and this was, uh, I couldn't get hard data on this one, unfortunately, but we also do know, that a very large proportion of those computers were never actually used, that were given, were, were never really used at any level. Kids would prefer to get their own tech and use their own tech. Yeah. Uh, and they and they had access to that. Yeah. So that's a whole other issue. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I know all this stuff is so complex and fascinating. Uh, the, the second part of that story is that she eventually decided that this wasn't working for her, it wasn't working for her son, and, and she shifted him to a school where there was a far less reliance on mm technology where there was a bit more emphasis on perhaps some of the more human elements of learning and relating in the classroom and group work and interpersonal stuff. And so I'm, I'm wondering for parents who are now in a situation where we're looking at, okay, if the future of work is that there will be more AI, that there will be a requirement to be far more flexible, that certain jobs will disappear altogether, but we don't necessarily know what the new jobs will be. What can we do as parents to best prepare our kids for this new way of working, this new future? It's, I'm going to go back to some surprisingly old school thinking on this <laughs> because, because my research does show increasingly that this is true. First thing, read to your child. Mm-hmm. I literally will stop young parents in the street and say, do you have books for your children? And sometimes I even carry books around and give them. Because <laughs> the data in so many aspects from medical data, doing brain scans that we can do now, um, to longitudinal studies shows just reading to your child for three times a day for 10 minutes each time, three by three, three books in that 10 minutes, one old, one new, one the kid chooses, 
that model has an unbelievably powerful difference. It, it is more significant than having a good teacher, just that parental reading. Interestingly, there's a gender issue in this as well, because we do know in Australia that um, men, fathers don't read to their child very much. And it's no surprise that around year seven, uh, a little bit before year seven, when boys start creating their gender identity, they stop reading because the teachers are mostly female yes. <laughs> and, and their mums are the ones who are reading them. So they associate uh, reading with being a, a female attribute. Yeah, a female female attribute. Yeah. Non- uh, now, uh, we know that when you throw a male teacher into that mix, we don't get the same thing happening. So my recommendation, mum, dad, take turns, read to your child. Mm-hmm. The problem is that we've got a society where both mum and dad are working long hours. Um, so we see in low socioeconomics, we see a big dip in, in that literacy. Also in high socioeconomics, because what we what one of the little pieces of side study, and again, not statistically big enough sample size to prove it, but we do think that when people are in high economic brackets and they are just giving their kids devices and saying, here, go and read on that. We go and play Little Einstein. We, we get the dip again it's in literacy. Yeah. So, you know, so that's the number one thing. Nursery rhymes, song, books, even just newspapers, even just sitting with the child or reading the newspaper with them, um, whatever. It doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter. It's just the, the act of reading. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, um, and I think what I'd like to see is parents have a good under a, a re- imagining of what STEM really is. I'm a big advocate for STEM, but not for how it's currently being described. STEM, as it's currently described, is all about preparing kids for this workforce. Not the right thing to do. Think of it this way. STEM is what we call constructivism. It's actually where the concept of STEM came from. Uh, A wonderful guy called um, Seymour Papert. Um, He was a hippie in the 70s, a brilliant man at MIT, Um, developed the robotic turtle and a whole bunch of things. But his view was mathematical thinking and engineering thinking. These types of thinking are extremely powerful for solving modern problems. He was a big advocate of the emotional as well, but he was saying that we need more than that. We need to be able to work and build things in our environment. So constructivism literally is we, we create our own learning. We construct our own learning by using the world around us. And his attitude is that's what the role of technology is. You give children an appropriate technology set. One of the best of those is Lego. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, mentioned I was Lego. about Lego. I was actually imagining, yeah, yeah, playing Lego. It's, 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 it's physical. It's tangible. And the Lego robotics is fantastic, not because your children are going to be building robots in the future, but because they define a problem that they want to build. They figure out how to solve that. And sure, they might come to you and say, how do I do this? How do I do that? Or more likely these days, they might go onto YouTube and learn from each other. But what it is, is they're taking direction of this discovery of problem solving. So reframe STEM to constructivism. Rechain, you know, change how you think about what technology your child uses to being, will this help my child create what they want to create, experiment with what they want to investigate. And it's a very old concept, but we know that it's got a much higher um, rate of seeing a whole range of out- positive outcomes than giving a kid a computer. Yeah, and it sounds to me as though there is some overlap there between what in psychology is a really popular topic at the moment, the growth mindset, this idea that if we have yes. a mindset that we see every challenge as an opportunity, every, you know, again, in inverted commas, failure as an opportunity to figure out what is it that didn't go right here? What can I take from this and learn from it and then continue on? So this same sort of yes. problem solving, creativity, yep. Thinking about things in terms of, you know, how, how do I grow and learn from this? And whether that's me as a person, which I suppose is kind of the psychological take on it, or me as a problem solver who can construct ideas or things. And take joy in that, usually. If, yeah, if you do it right, yeah. they also take joy of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ab- absolutely. In fact, I, I believe that some of the things that we now see in coming into corporations, certainly the most high performing corporations, usually will have something, you know, a growth mindset or a learning culture, whatever you want to give them that name to, they're very, very similar. Mm. But they all have their origins in, I believe, in this constructivism idea. And constructivism itself actually comes even further. It's, it was known even pre-war, pre-World War One in the 30s. There was this notion of the inventor. 
And ultimately, that's something you can't give to a machine. Even the smartest AI, they will solve a given problem for a given question. The role of the inventor, that is ask the right question. Frame it correctly. Um, figure out when the answer doesn't seem quite right or, more importantly, just as importantly, I should say, when the answer might be right but for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. And these are important things that that really do sit in the, in the, in the realm of human. And I, even with AI, I don't see us getting to that level of nuance mm-hmm. even by the – because we are expecting, you know, give you an idea on how fast AI is moving. I have a friend whose mission was to translate all of the world's information into – the niche languages of the world into Thai, into Baha'i, into these small, small languages. That's a mission. Very expensive. That's a mission. <laughs> you can't program a computer. We used to program computers to do translation. No, he knew that they needed to do with AI. So for the last decade, he's been working on this. Um, the company name is Omnisense. It's a fascinating uh, project to work in. But what we see from that last year, they had an 80 times cost performance improvement in their, in their learning engine in the thing that reads one language, reads another language and figures out how to translate them as good as, if not better than your average translator. And 80 times increase. Mm. It's not the fact that we've got new algorithms. It is it is to do with the cloud and all these technologies. And it was absolutely predictable. And we're going to keep on seeing that type of acti- that those huge leaps, huge leaps in the space. We will be seeing you know, a very, very real likelihood of an AI that is indistinguishable from conversation. Mm. And, and you know, these are, <laughs> my watch is telling me to do things. <laughs> AI talking for. about things, having conversations with you. <laughs> exactly. No, I turned off my phone, but my watch still gets me. <laughs> so, you know, our, the children of today are going to be living in that world and mm. they're going to be facing some very, very big challenges that we've left them. Um, housing prices that are literally unaffordable for all but you know, the people who already own houses, environmental degradation, mass population, the rise of China as a superpower and its use of AI and monitoring its people. Um, that will lead to all sorts of tensions. There, there's so many issues. Now, we had our own problems growing up. We had the Cold War and so forth, and we worked our way through them individually. How will our kids keep their heads above water? And that will be to leverage technology but knowing how to use it to their own ends. So learning to think, I think, is is kind of learning. We're reading, to, learn, learning. learning to use their environment to yeah. think. That yeah. takes us all the way back to the beginning, which is yeah. you can't separate the cognition from the environment from the human. Mm. Mm. And anything else we should be doing as parents to prepare our kids for this world? We're, we're <laughs> reading with them and we're teaching them to to think and think about <clears> the tools <throat> that they have and how they uh, can use those to yeah. solve problems. I I actually think it's really, really important, and, and this one is, is where we get a little contentious. This is not – there's no evidence, strong evidence for me to say this, but I actually think teaching philosophy is super important. And uh, sometimes people think of philosophy as, oh, it's this dusty old thing about talking about old people from the past. No, it's actually looking at different ways of asking questions, questioning the questioner. And it is, comes to the very heart of what I'm talking about here. So when I talked about uh, earlier about um, ethical frameworks in, in education, that was a term from philosophy. That's actually how you think about what the purpose of education is. It wasn't, you know, saying God and Ten Commandments or whatever. So if a child has an understanding that thinking is a constructed process as well, then they can be exceedingly flexible and resilient and we are going to see a big degradation. We're going to see a lot of losses of entry-level jobs. They just won't exist. So how do you then learn to go from no experience to a job that requires deep experience? Well, that is going to require the thinking skills that are required for that is the ability to be very flexible in, in how you reframe your thinking to think about thinking. So I think philosophy is, is something which is um, important. There's a wonderful podcast called Philosophize This. I recommend it to everybody. My yes. son loves it. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> but also just talking to the children, challenging them, um, exposing them to different modes of thinking and then deconstructing those. Um, not a lot of evidence, as I said, not a lot of evidence to show that that would lead to huge academic outcomes or long-term live outcomes, um, but it makes sense. It's part mm. of that constructivism concept. Mm. Mm. Uh, the only other thing is that, 
Um, don't be afraid to spend money buying professional grade solutions for your child to work with. So, for example, if your kid loves making videos, sure, they can use their iPhone or whatever. But if they show a real knack for, say, make, they start making music videos, go and grab a copy. You know, it'll cost you 140 bucks if you can afford it. Go and grab a copy of um, Vegas Video Editing Suite and give it to them, saying, here, give them the pro tools because that gives them headroom to do more experimentation. Okay. And – and a purely practical basis, they will start earning some cash from that. <laughs> now they've got practical <laughs> well, skills. Yeah, but yeah, really, I mean, that's not the goal. The goal is that they are then accelerated in their learning. Uh, know, anything in the yeah. suite, you, you get the idea. Yeah. So there's there's big advantages to to giving your giving your kids the tools that a professional would use. Yeah, yeah. Just giving that. Well, it is about the tools, isn't it? You know, if, if they've got yeah. the thinking, they've got the interest and the passion, then using the tools to allow you know without a ceiling. Then I exactly. suppose. Without a ceiling, that's beautiful. Exactly. Mm, mm. They can continue to kind of grow and at their own pace and fueled by their own passion. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Joe, this has been a fascinating conversation. You've given me so much to think about and read up on. I'm going to pop the links to a number of the resources that you've mentioned there, books and YouTube videos and, and other um, and podcasts that uh, I'll pop all of those in the show notes for today's episode. I've really enjoyed it. Yes, I'm going to go away and, and think about what I need to do. I'm going to get um, get my kids thinking about philosophy, <laughs> which is something that interests me as well anyway, and certainly interests my husband. You know, I, I don't think it will be too much of a stretch for us to, to get to that point. And also, yeah, the reading. Mine do read. The little one in particular is passionate about his reading and is often found with his hidden book. His big brother is probably more likely to be on the basketball court, but that's, that's okay. okay <laughs> we've, we've got to play to their strengths. But I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm going to think deeply and I'll certainly pop all the tips that you've given us together in our little guest profile sheet that we put in the show notes for each episode. Um, and hopefully we've given other parents and interested parties something to think about in relation to kids' education, uh, tools, technology, and the future of work. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I don't know about you, but my mind's been blown by that conversation with Dr. Joe Sweeney. So many topics covered there, from philosophy to problem solving and constructivism, to technology, to teaching kids, to education, to parenting, and something as fundamental as reading books to our kids. There was so much in there, and it really, really has got me thinking, and I hope it's got you thinking too. If you'd like to learn more about Joe's work and his research or explore the books, podcasts and videos that he's recommended, you'll find the links to all of these in the show notes for this episode. Pop over to potential.com.au forward slash podcast to take a look. If you're new to the Potential Psychology Podcast, I invite you to go back and listen to the great guests I've interviewed so far this season and in season one. We've covered digital parenting, building confidence, the woman's brain, helping kids to manage stress and anxiety, psychology and yoga, tips for productivity, and how to overcome adversity and emerge happier and stronger. You'll find every episode in iTunes, on Stitcher, via your favorite podcast player, and now on Google Podcasts. While you're there, I'd love it if you could leave a rating and review as this spreads the word about the podcast and gives me and the team great feedback on what's working well. If you haven't already, you might also like to join the Potential Psychology community by signing up to my regular newsletter at potential.com.au forward slash subscribe. This will keep you up to date with the latest podcast episodes and blog posts, link you up to top articles in positive psychology, performance and well-being, and give you the behind the scenes here at Potential Psychology HQ. In our next episode, I'm talking to Andrea Downey, co-founding director of Project Thrive, an Australian organisation that's fusing positive psychology, education, sociology, anthropology, wellness and leadership with the goal of promoting well-being, health and psychological flexibility in individuals and systems, including our schools. Here's a snippet of what Andrea has to share with us. They were talking about free-range chickens and one of the students put her hand up and asked the principal, are we free-ranged or are we caged? Thinking about the classroom situation and she said it was the most you know, insightful question she'd ever been asked and it made her stop and think. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Have a wonderful week.